Well, good evening. Good evening. I'm Gleaves Whitney. I'm director of the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies here at Grand Valley State University. Proud to serve in that capacity. And one of the reasons I'm proud to serve in that capacity is because of the wonderful colleagues with whom I get to work uh, in a lot of different uh, areas. For example, our donor community. We have a wonderful donor community here in Grand Valley, uh, in West Michigan, as you know. And I'm thinking particularly of uh, Ralph Hallenstein and his family. We have some family members here in the front row. Suzanne, thank you very much for being here this evening. Uh, she brings uh, greetings from Ralph. Ralph is going to be 102 years old eight weeks from today. Pretty amazing. Let's give him a hand. It's also a privilege to serve with such great colleagues here at Grand Valley State University. If you look at the academic leadership, we've been very fortunate to have wonderful academic leadership. We have Tom Haas, of course, as president. Tom, are you here this evening? Uh, but certainly representing us this evening and uh, my co-host this evening is Provost Gail Davis. Gail, thank you so much for your support for what we're doing. Let's give Gail a hand. And we have great colleagues in the community who've been very supportive of uh, the Hallenstein Center and of Grand Valley and our Common Ground Initiative in particular. I think of Noreen Myers and all of her work that she does. And here in the audience, I think we have Hillary Snell and Marilyn Teich and Fred Bogart and Jonathan White and others who have been just outstanding champions of what we represent in this community. And I appreciate all that they do to help spread the word about what Grand Valley believes in what the Hallenstein Center represents and our Common Ground Initiative in particular. We really are uh, delighted to have a speaker this evening who represents so much of what we're trying to do in the Common Ground Initiative. Now, I don't want to go through the biography in detail because you have that in your program this evening. It's a very accomplished speaker tonight in Colin Woodard and we're so proud to have him. I do want to say something about how his talk is going to fit in this evening. Uh, when uh, we started the Common Ground Initiative a year and a half ago, our object was to try to do something in higher education that is unique. No other institution, no other university in American higher edu education is seeking to invite conservatives and progressives to come together and redefine their respective traditions. Uh, and in so doing, in searching out their political roots, their cultural roots, their geographic roots perhaps, in so doing, searching for ways to come together to find common ground. Now you see why Colin Woodard was the logical person to have at some point in our series this year. Because you see, he throws a little bit of a wrench, a monkey wrench, into the thesis. You know, it's when you listen to, to Colin, when you read his, his wonderful book on the American nations, and the 11 nations in particular, you see it's not just about getting progressives on the left coast together with progressives in Boston, say, in Yankeedom. It's not just about getting conservatives, uh, say, in the Midlands or in the Chicago area, say, with uh, uh, conservatives in the Deep South. Sometimes they speak past each other, even within that tradition. Colin Woodard is the man who can address that issue better than anybody else in this country, I believe. And that's why Gail and I are so proud to host him this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Colin Woodard. And thank you all. Can you hear me fine in the back? Very good. Well, thank you very much to the Houtenstein Center for having me and to Grand Valley State University. It's a great pleasure to uh, be speaking to you all here, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm especially pleased to be here as part of the Common Ground Initiative. Um, I think it's a delightful and uh, much needed project, and I'm so thrilled that you're doing it here. Had you not invited me, I wouldn't have been aware that this uh, exists, and I think it's a, a worthy and admirable pursuit, and I, I look forward to learning more about it. Um, my own book, American Nations, what I can offer you is uh, um, some more clarity and detail in some of the uh, obstacles that our country faces in finding common ground because uh, there are structural problems that are historic and geographical in nature that are essential to understanding some of the divisions that we face, both within the movements we call conservative and progressive or, or it, the many other ways that you can interpret politics. Um, and I do so and wrote the book in the hopes that by understanding these things better, that we may be able to move the conversation uh, 
more productively forward because you need to understand the problem and define some of the terms and issues that we're arguing about as a nation or as a culture uh, in order to move forward and reconcile and find the common ground. Um, now, American Nations, as you probably know, is a book about the importance of understanding American regionalism and the real regional fissures in the country to understanding our history, our national identity, and indeed even our current uh, political cleavages, which are geographic even as they are ideological. Now, I think we all know that regionalism is important on some level, right? We hear about it all the time. You know, there's a, you know, blue states and red states and never the twain shall meet, right? And there's, there's a place, you know, the, there's the Civil War and supposedly there's a place called the South that's still busy fighting it. Uh, we know that in presidential elections that the candidate of, uh, of uh, any particular party is supposed to go to the voters of New Hampshire in the primaries and say one set of things and then two weeks later go to the voters in, of his very same party and say a completely different set of things when he gets to South Carolina. We know that even in this Tea Party era, some place like Vermont or Mississippi might as well be on separate planets in terms of religious values, political priorities, notions of what the proper role is of government, of the balance between church and state, and even the importance of key words in the American lexicon like freedom or liberty, or how we should define American values or identity. Indeed, we're no more a united single culture, a united nation, than Europe is. Our component uh, cultures are really more diverse and share fewer values than any two European Union member states do today. But we can't talk about these critical differences in any sort of meaningful way because we don't have the right map. Now, people talk about regionalism all the time, right? But they're talking about it in the terms used from the, you know, the federal government's uh, you know, large you know, labor and census regions. So we hear about data being parsed you know, from pollsters or uh, what have you on the lines of there being a northeast and a midwest and a south and a west. Now, these all follow state lines. And in doing so, they distort and minimize the actual impact of regional cultures on uh, the national debate. It misses the true cultural fissures, which are historically based and consistent through the centuries and rarely respect state or even international boundaries. Now again, we all know this, right? When you think about it, we know that the state boundaries don't capture it. I mean, how many people here happen to be from Maryland? Anyone? Because Marylanders all know that there are three Marylands and they can all tell you exactly where the borders are between the three. There's the three Texases, right? We have, everyone in Texas knows that Austin is the state capital, but that Dallas and San Antonio and Houston are the hubs of three very different Texases. There's upstate and downstate Illinois. There's the coastal strip you can see on that map of northern part of California and of British Columbia and Washington State and Oregon, which share a great deal in common with each other, but almost nothing with the interiors of their own states and provinces. Hey, you remember that line that uh, the you know, Clinton political strategist James Carville uh, used to say about um, understanding statewide politics in Pennsylvania? You know, in his classic sort of Cajun accent, he would tell everybody, you know, there's, you gotta understand, there's Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and Alabama in between. <laughs> and if he's talking about the highlands of, the, uh, of Alabama, then he's on pretty firm ground. Hey, the people of the state of Missouri can't even agree on a regional basis how to pronounce the name of the state. So we know state boundaries are missing something, right? And yet, in times of disunity and discord, many Americans still go and seek solace in the works of the founding fathers, hoping that if we returned to their ideals, if we understood and followed their intent, we could find our misplaced sense of common purpose, restore our civic strength, and return the union to unity. But this effort is continually frustrated by the simple fact that the men who came together to confront a common enemy in 1775 and to try to build a more lasting union in 1787 to 1789 were not our country's founders, but rather the founders' great and great great and great great grandchildren. Because the original founders, the ones in the 17th and 18th century, shared little 
on a regional basis in common in terms of purpose and intent and ideals. The fact is that most of our regional cultures have been with us since those early colonial days, since the 1600s and early 1700s. Now, the original clusters of North American colonies along the East Coast and along the Southern Rim were settled by people from distinct regions of the British Isles and from France and the Netherlands and Spain, each with their own religious and political and ethnographic characteristics. For generations, these discrete Euro-American cultures developed in remarkable isolation from one another. They developed their own cherished principles, their own fundamental values, and they expanded across the eastern half of the continent in nearly exclusive settlement bands. Here you can see, you know, these are the original hearts of the colonial clusters along the seaboard. And then the, you know, the, the, the areas in which they started uh, prior to the revolution to each colonize. And at the point of the revolution, the line of settlement is in the shading. Now, the next map you see, the dark part is going to be that shading you see there. And this carries things forward into the mid-19th century as to what the patterns were. Now, um, some of these nations championed individualism. Others, utopian social reform. Some believe themselves to be guided by, uh, by uh, divine purpose. Others championed the freedom of conscience and inquiry. Um, some embraced a specific and explicit Anglo-Protestant identity. Others, ethnic and religious pluralism. Some valued equality and democratic participation. Others, deference to a traditional aristocratic social order modeled on the slave states of classical antiquity. Throughout the colonial period in the early republic, they saw themselves as competitors for land, for settlers, for capital. And even as enemies, they took the opposite sides in key conflicts, like the English Civil War, the 1640s, the American Revolution, the War of 1812. Nearly all of these regional cultures you see on this map here would consider leaving the Union in the 80-year period after the Battle of Yorktown. And as we all know, two went to war to do so in the 1860s. The point is that there's never been one America, really, but several Americas. And today, there are 11 of them. This is a county resolution map, you can see, uh, of, of the, where things lie today. Now, I'm going to briefly, very briefly, introduce them. Now, starting up in the, towards the upper right corner and extending on through into where we are today is Yankeedom. Now, this is a regional culture that was founded on the shores of Massachusetts Bay by radical Calvinists, you know, the early Puritans as a new Zion. And since the outset, it's put great emphasis on perfecting earthly society through social engineering, individual self-denial for the common good, very New England idea, and the aggressive assimilation of outsiders. It's prized education, intellectual achievement, and community rather than individual empowerment and broad citizen participation in politics and government, witness the New England style town meeting. The latter seen as the public shield against the machinations of grisping aristocrats and other would-be tyrants. You work your way down, and well, let me explain just for a moment here so you understand the patterning here. So the culture began in New England with the Puritans, and what this map shows is following those settlement um, um, uh, paths that I showed earlier, New Englanders largely settled much of upstate New York. And one of the reasons they did so is because, you know, many of the coastal colonies, in theory, claimed land all the way to the Pacific. They didn't know where the Pacific was, but they claimed land there between latitude lines. And so Massachusetts had a claim to vast stretches of upstate New York. So once, uh, you know, the province of New York was freed from royal control and they were trying to figure out who was going to get what, Massachusetts wanted all of upstate New York. Well, eventually they said, no, New York is going to have upstate New York. But in compensation, Massachusetts, the Commonwealth, will receive land title to millions and millions of acres of upstate New York. And therefore, Massachusetts passed on to Massachusetts-based land companies who guided the settlement of much of upstate New York bringing people from Massachusetts, often transplanting his entire communities led by their Calvinist uh, uh, cleric, onto the frontier and recreating New England-style towns with their institutions and assumptions and, uh, and laws and social order. 
Ditto for, you see that part of, of Ohio over there that's uh, in Yankeedom? That is the Western Reserve of Ohio. And it's called the Western Reserve because it was the Western Reserve of Connecticut. Connecticut, in a similar way, claimed that part of what later was to be the Ohio Territory. And it, too, was settled, bought, settlement was guided by Connecticut-based land companies who moved people in exactly the same fashion, which is why today not only are there all these New England architectural-style towns, they're all named after towns in Connecticut. You move forward a generation when the Michigan Territory and Wisconsin and Minnesota would later be settled, and they were settled in the early settlement waves almost entirely by people from the Western Reserve of Ohio, the Yankee upstate of New York, and New England. In the case, for instance, of Michigan, five of your original six chief executives of your state and territory were Yankees, four of them born in New England. And much of the early lumbering industry were transplanted people from the northern parts of Maine, is still largely an unoccupied industrial forest, where northern boreal North American forest commercial uh, lumberjacking and harvesting was first perfected. So that's the basics you see in the thesis of how it spread. It's following the lines of settlement, and these other uh, nations that I described would have a similar story where I had to unpack each of it. So in brief and very brief, moving on. So you move south into the Big Apple area. That little area there, with an enormous number of people today, is New Netherland. Now this area was not settled by the English at all, but rather and significantly by the Dutch at a time in the 1650s and 1660s when the Netherlands was the most sophisticated society in the Western world. It has displayed the salient characteristics of, uh, of late 17th century uh, Amsterdam ever since. It's a global commercial trading culture, multi-ethnic and multi-religious and materialistic, with a profound tolerance for diversity and an unflinching commitment to the freedom of inquiry and conscience. Like 17th century Amsterdam, New York City today has emerged as the leading global center of publishing, trade, and finance, a magnet for immigrants, and a refuge for those persecuted by other regional cultures here or other kingdoms back in uh, Europe during the, uh, during the classic period uh, in, in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, here from the Sephardim uh, in the 17th century coming to Manhattan Island to gays, feminists, and bohemians in the early 20th. It's not a particularly democratic place or concerned with the great moral questions like the Yankee uh, Puritans were always uh, wrapped up in, but it has nonetheless in recent, uh, recent decades found itself in an alliance with Yankeedom in a defense of the shared commitment to public sector institutions uh, without which uh, life in the Big Apple would be virtually impossible. The next tier down, the Midlands, which are starting as you can see in the Delaware Valley and then spreading out in an increasing fan over much of the heartland, this is America's great swing region. And it was founded by English Quakers, witness William Penn's project in, uh, in, in early Pennsylvania in the Delaware Valley. Now, the Quakers believed in humans' inherent goodness, the inner light, right? Which meant that they welcomed, one of the policy implications of that was that their immigration policy was enormously open. They welcomed people of many nations and creeds to their utopian colonies along the shores of Delaware Bay. Southern New Jersey today, much of Delaware, parts of Maryland, parts of uh, Pennsylvania. And it spawned the culture of middle America and the heartland, pluralistic, organized around the middle class, where ethnic and ideological purity have never been a priority, where government has been seen as an unwelcome intrusion, and where political opinion has been moderate, even apathetic. It's been an ethnic mosaic from the start. Pennsylvania at the time of the revolution had a German rather than a British majority. It shares the Yankee belief that society should be organized for the benefit of ordinary people, but unlike Yankees, it entirely rejects top-down intervention and has much less faith in public institutions being able to engineer uh, better outcomes. Work your way down a little further down into the Chesapeake and Tidewater country in the uh, eastern parts of North Carolina, you reach the Tidewater. Now, this is a culture that was founded you know, as early as New England was and even earlier, but it was, and it was founded by English people, but what a different set of English people from the, uh, from the uh, Calvinists and their applied religious utopia. This is a place built by the younger sons of English gentry, and it was meant in the 1600s to reproduce the semi-feudal manorial society of the countryside that they'd left behind, where economic, political, and social affairs were run by and for landed aristocrats. They were essentially aiming for a sort of 17th century version of Downton Abbey. You know, the, we are the 
proper people to be guiding society. We are the heads, and for the good of everybody, you are the hands, and all these sort of enlightenment principles in there, but conveniently, we are the heads. So as you would imagine, um, you know, they, they found a great deal of difficulty in the American context in this sort of foiled their original plans because they couldn't find anyone who wanted to volunteer to stand in the role of the peasantry. And so they, they turned first in desperation to indentured servants and later, as the 1600s ended, uh, slided into a full-on slave system. But that wasn't the original plan in the Tidewater. Now, Tidewater has, of course, always been a fundamentally conservative place with that kind of background, with a high value placed on respect for authority and tradition, and not much on equality or public participation in politics. This was the most powerful nation in the 18th century. But today, it's a nation in decline, having been boxed out of westward expansion by its boisterous uh, Appalachian neighbors. And today, you know, if, if you, some people ask, will this map change? Well, yeah, things change. They just change very slowly. You know, things will change. Cultures come and go on a centuries and millennia scale. But if you were to ask me what's the most likely change ahead, it's that the tide water is slowly disappearing, I believe. And part of it is because for all of these centuries it was unable to expand, um, but also because the federal government happens to be based right on its periphery. So you have in the District of Columbia and down in Norfolk, the site of the world's largest naval base, you have a massive federal spending and presence of trillions of dollars, which allows there to exist millions of people who can live economic, social, and cultural lives within that federal universe with no reference at all to the tidewater culture around them. So it's slowly diluting and eating away uh, from the tidewater from within. So yes, things do change on the map. Uh, the large white area you see there, Greater Appalachia, is next. And as you can see, it's much larger than the Appalachian mountain chain by itself. These are the areas founded in the early 18th century, so somewhat later, by wave upon wave of settlers from the war-ravaged borderlands of Northern Ireland, Northern England, and the Scottish Lowlands. Now, this is a place that has been lampooned by writers and screenwriters as being the home of hillbillies and rednecks. But it is really a transplanted culture from a, uh, formed in a state of almost near total danger and consistent anarchy and upheaval on those war-torn borderlands, um, and is characterized by a warrior ethic and a deep commitment to personal sovereignty and individual liberty. It was at a time when you, know, you couldn't count on the government or the police or the army to be there to protect you. You had to protect your kith and kin yourself. So an enormous uh, value placed on individuals and their kith and kin being able to protect themselves and being free from the outside authorities, which in their experience have often been tyrannical. So this is a culture that was intensely suspicious of both the lowland aristocrats I just described and Yankee social engineers alike. So Appalachia has shifted alliances through our history based on whomever of these parties appeared to be the greatest threat to their freedom. Since Reconstruction, and especially the upheavals of the 1960s, it's been an alliance with the Deep South in an effort to undo the federal government's power to overrule and interfere in local preferences. Working our way down to the, to the bottom there, to the Deep South, now this is, uh, when we talk about there being a South, there's never been a South, there are three dominant Souths, and they've not always been together. Hey, Appalachia by and large, in fact, was on the Union side of the Civil War. But the Deep South has not a very distinct place from the Tidewater, and they're often confused. This was a place established not by the you know, younger sons of English gentry, but in the 1660s and 1670s by English slave lords from the Caribbean island of Barbados who were bringing and transplanting a West Indies-style Caribbean slave society. And this region, you know, it was originally called Carolina in the West Indies in all the maps and references. Now this region, as you might imagine, has been a bastion of oligarchic privilege and a version of classical republicanism modeled on the slave states of the ancient world, where democracy was the privilege of the few and enslavement the natural lot of the many. Now, its slave and caste systems, of course, have been since destroyed, smashed by outside intervention, but its leaders continue to fight against robust environmental laws, against the expansion of federal power, on taxes on capital and the wealthy, and on robust environmental labor and consumer safety regulations. Working our way down to the south part of the country, you know, we tend to think often as Americans of the, uh, the, the country expanded from east to west, but what's often forgotten is that the oldest Euro-American 
colonial project that's in what's now the United States came from the south and came northward. It was the expansion of the much older Spanish um, empire in the Americas. You can see a map of its own expansion uh, here. So this is the, you know, you often hear that, you know, Spain claimed much of the Western United States. Well, yes, on paper, these parts that are shaded are the areas that were effectively settled by the Spanish prior to the U.S. annexations. And they're largely, although not exactly the same as what you see on the map, um, uh, the, the modern day map today. Now, so this is the oldest of those Euro-American nations. Um, it was so far when it was settled from the seats of power in Mexico City and back in Madrid that it evolved its own characteristics. You know, most Americans are aware that this area, you know, this region is a place apart, you know, where Hispanic language and culture and societal norms dominate. But few Americans realize that in the Mexican context, and recall that this extends on into the northern provinces of Mexico, that Norteños have a reputation for being more independent, self-sufficient, adaptable, and work-centered than their central and southern countrymen. Indeed, it's long been a hotbed in the Mexican context of democratic reform and revolutionary sentiment. Uh, various parts of the region, indeed, tried to secede from Mexico prior to the U.S. annexations to form independent buffer states, a third way that was neither to be exploited by the, uh, the distant imperial and feudal powers in Mexico City nor by the United States. You had the Republic of the Rio Grande. You had the Republic of Texas. Remember, the Republic of Texas effort was not merely Austin and, and, his, and the Anglos trying to secede. He was backed and was collaborating with the entire Spanish-speaking uh, elite of the province. Uh, they were wanting to create a third state in between, but it didn't turn out that way. Um, today, this uh, region stretches for about 100 miles on both sides of our shared border and in many ways resembles Germany during the Cold War. Two peoples with a common culture separated from one another by a large wall. Advance, please. There we go. Okay, now the next two nations I'm going to talk about, we've talked about the original ones. These two came later that I'm going to speak about. These are the second generation ones. They're much younger, settled in the uh, mid and second half of the 19th century. And they weren't settled by a particular groups from Europe coming and bringing and establishing a culture, but rather by the rest of us in a different context. The first one to be settled of these two was actually what I call the left coast, that coastal fringe settled long before anybody could uh, take on the uh, environmental climate uh, challenges of the vastness of the arid far west. So you can see it's a Chile-like nation wedged between the Pacific Ocean and the Cascade and Coast Mountain Ranges. And it was originally settled by two groups of European settlers, merchants, missionaries, and woodsmen from New England who arrived by sea and dominated the towns. Remember, at a time before railroads, and before highways or anything else, the easiest and safest way to get from the East Coast to the Pacific was to go all the way around South America through the Drake Passage and all the way back up again. And that's how the New Englanders arrived. But there was a second group of people as well coming overland in uh, generally by wagon across the vastness of the West who were farmers prospectors and fur traders who tended to be from Appalachian sections of the Midwest who controlled the countryside. Now the Yankee missionaries expended considerable effort and some of them were literally missionaries coming to reestablish and to create a New England on the Pacific, a new Massachusetts to save all of humanity once again, a new Zion and saw their trip around Cape Horn as a repetition of the Mayflower voyage and they were going to create a beacon of light for everybody in Asia to see and come see the good Calvinist way before it was too late. Um, but they were only partially successful in their effort. It is not another Yankeedom. And that's because they encountered the Appalachian traditions and they ended up with a hybrid, a, an unusual society that takes Yankee utopianism, the idea that we can engineer and create a better society now, the California dream as it were, with the Appalachian emphasis on individual self-expression and exploration. And think about it, it's a pretty fecund combination. All the companies that now dominate 21st century life are located in that tiny strip, be it Amazon or Microsoft or Apple or Facebook or Twitter or all the other companies of Silicon Valley. Um, it's been the staunchest ally since it was settled of Yankeedom, uh, and it clashes with the far western sections of the interior of its own states and provinces. And that takes us to the far west, the uh, last of these regions on the map that were uh, 
that were colonized. This is the other second generation nation. And it's the one part of the continent where I'll admit environmental factors really did trump ethnographic ones because it was so extreme in the context of the late 19th century. It was high and dry and remote and it stopped the, uh, the, the, the other cultures from expanding right in their tracks. You get close to the 100th meridian and you need large uh, irrigation projects to practice agriculture and all of their folk ways and ways of uh, growing food and such uh, could not proceed. In fact, with minor exceptions, this region could only be colonized during the technology of that time through the massive deployment of vast industrial resources, railroads, heavy mining equipment, ore smelters, dams, irrigation systems. And as a result, settlement was actually directed and controlled either by large corporations headquartered in distant places like New York and Boston and Chicago and San Francisco, or by the federal government itself, which controlled and owned much of the land, still does. So it ended up being exploited ever since as an internal colony for the benefit of the rest of us. And the far west people are well aware of this and have been often resentful of it. It's a dependent status that has had the far west uh, turning against, in the progressive era, against the large corporations, the Hearsts and the Anaconda Coppers and the Union Pacific Railways of the world, and in the late 20th century against the overreach of the federal government. So it's uh, shifted back and forth in its alliances, uh, trying to uh, throw off its, uh, the masters who've tormented it. Now, there are two other nations I'll introduce briefly that only have small enclaves within the United States but are very important players in Canada. Uh, briefly, there's New France. Uh, it's got an enclave, of course, around New Orleans and southern Louisiana, but the, the main core being in, the, uh, in Quebec. Uh, this is a culture that blends the folkways of Ancien Regime northern French peasantry with the traditions and values of the aboriginal people they encountered in northwest North America. It's completely unlike, remember this place was founded by Champlain during the reign of Louis XIV, the Sun King, who made Versailles. That's what he was aiming for, feudal society. Not at all, ended up being this down-to-earth, egalitarian, consensus-driven place. You know why? Because all the peasants arrived and were supposed to be tending the land for their masters, and they saw the Indians, all the peasants from northern France, are like, hey, you know, we get along with them pretty well. And they, run off and learn to snowshoe and start families with them and pretty soon you got all these letters you can read in the archives of all these you know french noblemen who are starving i do not know how to use a hoe and the peasants have run away with the indians you know please send food so the whole you know louis the 14th's uh, plans went awry and indeed quebec is a very different place than uh, france itself uh, to this day now uh after a long period of imperial oppression, you know, after the defeat of uh, New France by the British, uh, they've, they've uh, come out of that during the Quiet Revolution of the 1960s and have imparted many of their attitudes on the Canadian Federation itself, where multiculturalism and negotiated consensus are treasured. In Canada, where the idea is the negotiation, which may never end, and that's fine, it's the whole point. That's a very, uh, that's a very uh, uh, aboriginal idea from the St. Lawrence Valley. And the other, First Nation, you can only see a little bit of it. If you could see all of it, it would extend onwards up over much of Alaska, the entire Canadian Shield and the far north, all the way on into Greenland, including uh, much of Labrador and onwards, an area uh, that is larger than the entire continental United States and then some. Um, this is either the newest or the oldest of these nations, depending on how you want to look at it, because it's populated by Native American groups and tribes who generally never gave up their land by treaty or any other means to the rest of us at any time and have largely retained their cultural practices and knowledge to allow them to survive in what's an incredibly hostile and remote region to a surprising degree still on their own terms. Now they're reclaiming their sovereignty because, you know, in the 19th century, nope, they were so remote, so far away from everything and all that worthless Arctic land, nobody bothered to come force them you know, or trick them and take away their land. It never happened. And they've pointed that out recently to the Canadian Constitutional Court and to the authorities in the Kingdom of Denmark, which has overrule over Greenland. And uh, the courts have agreed. I guess you're right. It still is your land. Only now that land isn't worthless at all. That's the great storehouse of everything for North America. That's oil and petroleum resources and natural gas and minerals and water and everything you can imagine. And now 
the native tribes, many of them Innu and Inuit speaking in those regions, have a seat at the table to decide what's going to happen. And in Greenland, um, we may see a really interesting thing. You know, if Greenland's part of North America. We often forget it's an Inuit speaking uh, place. It has self government and is on the verge of full independence. And if you ever, you, know, you ever wonder, well, I wonder what would have happened if we hadn't you know, taken all the land away from and destroyed all the Native American groups. What kind of society would they have created to confront the challenges of the 21st century? Well, in Greenland, we're about to find out because they're about to become independent. It's all Inuit and Inuit speaking and Inuit controlled. And it's a really interesting take on things. I, I was up there in 2007 for a bit. And one of the things I quickly learned that was so striking is in Inuit culture, women have never been subservient or in a secondary role. They've always been co-equals. And this has all sorts of ramifications there. I mean, because alcoholism and other modern problems have fallen more on men, almost all the mayors and government ministers and the Lutheran bishop of Greenland are all women. Their, their country's being run largely by women. And they tell these great stories, talking to the foreign minister, also a woman who was telling me, the one thing you have to understand about Greenland is when the Danish came in the 1700s and they said to us, See, we have a God, and he looks like us, and we want you to worship him. And we looked at each other, and we said, he? <laughs> totally different take. By the way, I told that very story to an audience of school teachers in the Appalachian part of Ohio. Nobody laughed. <laughs> so, as mentioned, these are the 11 nations. Their effect on history has been profound. The maps you see are echoed in the battle lines of the English Civil War and the American Revolution and the debates by district and representative of the First Continental Congress and those leading up to the U.S. Civil War by congressional districts and the culture wars and civil rights struggles in the 1960s and the presidential maps of many of our hotly contested elections. But I'll unpack for you a little bit just so you can get a sense of what some of the ramifications can be. There's a county map, presidential election with all classic, you know, you can't look at the red state, blue state maps. You've got to look at the red, blue county maps. And you can see, there you go. There's Yankeedom. You can see the Western Reserve of Ohio popping out there. You can see the left coast set out in one color and the others in the other. Except, you know, I haven't tweaked the colors. The red really is Republican. This is the map not of the 2008 or 2012 election. This is the 1916 presidential election, Woodrow Wilson versus Charles Hughes. Remember, you know, the parties come and go. The parties have inverted regionally, you know, since the uh, 1960s. You know, Yankee, the Republican Party was the party of Yankeedom for the, uh, explicitly for the first century of existence. They've inverted now, but whenever you have a tightly contested issue, the same fissure lines pop in our history, starting in almost any of our elections. More familiar map, you can see the colors have inverted by 2008, the Obama-McCain election. Again, Western Reserve of Ohio, left coast. You can now see uh, El Norte coming out there in a way it didn't before, huh? Well, why is that? And notice that it's no longer a monochrome deep south. There's got a little bit of other colors in there on the map. Well, the main reason is what's the biggest difference between 1916 and 2008 electorally is Hispanic and black people were effectively allowed to vote uh, in between. So those are majority black counties and those are the reassertion of the uh, um, dominant demographically and uh, cultural population within El Norte happening on the map. But otherwise, almost entirely consistent. All right, this is one of my favorite maps, um, reproduced quite a few times. This is after the 2008 election, or the, the Obama you know, landslide election. It asked by county what changed between the 2004 and 2008 presidential races. So in 2004, right, that was uh, George W. Bush's second race against John Kerry. And what the map represents is, okay, in 2008, did this county vote more for the Democrat or more for the Republican than they did in the previous election? And the answer, no surprise, in the great you know, Obama you know, uh, landslide you know, of hope and change, was that most places voted more for the Democratic candidate than they had uh, for, you know, for, more for Obama than they had for Kerry, except for an area almost exactly duplicative of my greater Appalachia. Did terrible. Obama has a greater Appalachia problem, incredibly weak in that region in that election cycle. And hey, it's not only you know, in the national elections. You know, Obama's problem in that is just enormous. Um, he knows that too. In the last, you know, 2012, in the Democratic primaries last election cycle, he's the incumbent president, right, of the United States. He had a really tough time in the Democratic primaries in Appalachia against unknown challengers. In West Virginia, 41% of Democratic primary voters 
cast ballots for a Texas prison inmate instead of the sitting president of the United States from their party. In Kentucky, 42% of Democrats preferred uncommitted over the sitting incumbent president of their party. In Arkansas, he won 58 to 41 in his party's primary over an attorney from Tennessee, but lost, you know, because uh, diagonally, the, uh, the, the top left is greater Appalachia, the lower right of Arkansas is deep south. In those um, Appalachian counties, he lost almost every single one by 30 to 50 points in the Democratic primary. Now, you would think this would be absolutely staggering, right? This must have thrown the entire election. What happened? You know, why, why, why did Obama win re-election? Because Mitt Romney also had a greater Appalachia problem. You know, Barack Obama, well, he was uh, you know, born in Hawaii, but he spent most of his adult political and professional and academic life in Yankeedom, and he's essentially is the candidate of Yankeedom articulating the, the general um, you know, Yankee policy prescriptions for the country. In the conservative context, Mitt Romney is also, he's from Yankeedom, he's the Yankee conservative articulating those values. He's uh, you know, the, the governor of a Yankee state and the son of George Romney, governor of yet another Yankee state, and comes indeed, even his religion, Mormonism, remember, was founded by Yankees in the burnt over districts of New York uh, and Vermont and elsewhere and shares that communitarian utopian purpose with the Puritans. Um, so, you know, the government is not necessarily the enemy in those things, which is why Utah has one of the best, you know, Salt Lake City has one of the best and most comprehensive light rail systems in the country. So, plays very badly in Greater Appalachia, both of them. So, unfortunately for me, in providing analysis for everybody in 2012, the general election was a bit of a wash because there were no regional differences because both candidates had the same regional strengths and weaknesses. Ah, but not so the Republican primaries. That was a great laboratory because you had Romney, the Yankee candidate, trying to close the deal against, uh, of the quarter finalists, uh, two of the other quarter finalists also had strong and clear regional associations and programs. You had Rick Santorum from Pennsylvania, who was the candidate of a greater Appalachia, and you had uh, Newt Gingrich, who spent uh, his entire adult uh, life and political life and academic life also in the Deep South, so the candidate of the Deep South. And indeed, you saw that in the Republican primaries, you saw the same patterns. Okay, so green shades is Romney, brown shades is Rick Santorum in Ohio in the Republican primaries. Romney only won because the Western Reserve went with him, and also a few uh, counties around Cincinnati there. I asked them uh, a number of uh, Republicans in the Cincinnati area when I was speaking there, why is that? Why is that anomaly there in the Republican primary? And they said, because we were voting strategically to stop Obama. So I don't know if that's true or not, but in any case, if it wasn't for the Western Reserve, Romney would not have won uh, the Ohio primary and may not have been the Republican nominee. Ditto Illinois, upstate and downstate Illinois, same pattern. Another really interesting one, so pollsters were saying, well, you know, once it comes, when it comes around to Alabama and Mississippi, Newt Gingrich is going to sweep things. That's where we're going to see a resurgence, and uh, you know, it's going to, it's, he's, he's going to do really well, and uh, and and so on and so forth. And Santorum doesn't stand a chance. We've done all our polling, and it shows that completely wrong. Um, Newt Gingrich did not win uh, at all in either state. Uh, Santorum walked away with Alabama and won fairly handily in Mississippi. What was wrong? How did the pollsters get it wrong? Because the pollsters were asking their questions and weighting their samples by the classic lines of gender and race and socioeconomic group. They were not weighting them by the regional cultures of the uh, people who were responding to their surveys. This is the election map. Um, so those brown counties going by 20, 30, and 40 points for Santorum in the Republican primary are the Appalachian counties. And Newt Gingrich in blue, Romney's in green, and Santorum were kind of fighting it out uh, in the deep south and, and, and fitting even and splitting the vote. Mississippi, same pattern, only the upper corner there of Mississippi's part of Appalachia. Santorum completely swept it, which allowed him to take the state as a whole. And here, just for reference, is the 2012 election. Just if you're curious, you can see the same pattern once again um, uh, in the same election and, and, and county results. And uh, just to part with, the uh, doesn't have to be, you can run this analysis in all kinds of things. It doesn't have to be electoral politics, even uh, cultural values. In this case, there's the famous uh, Proposition 8 vote, you know, for or against same-sex marriage, basically. And... The red are the counties in California that were for same-sex marriage in the vote, and the green are those against. As you can see, almost the entire left coast versus almost every county in the far west and El Norte sections of California. And finally, before I open it up for questions, um, 
One of the things you should push back on, and I hope you will push back and challenge me in many ways, but one thing you might ask is, okay, great, you've established that there were all these cultures that go back centuries and they had these characteristics, but millions and millions of people have moved from other parts of the world since. Uh, how could it possibly be that those relatively small numbers of settlers could possibly hold sway today? Well, part of the answer to that question lies in this map. So, this is the census map um, in 1900 by county, and the census takers asked everybody, hey, were you born in the United States or not? In 1900, this is right at the end of the great waves of late 19th century immigration. So you should be capturing a large proportion of the immigrants who'd come in and were foreign born. The darker the, uh, the color, the higher percentage of people reported being foreign born, being immigrants themselves. You'll notice the enormous regional variation. Virtually nobody immigrated in the great waves of immigration to greater Appalachia or the deep south or tidewater, which makes perfect sense. I mean, if you're fleeing poverty and autocracy and tyranny in your own country and a lack of land in a feudal system in Europe, you're not going to move to the same conditions in North America. And in fact, there's no surprise there'd be big concentrations in New Netherland and through parts of the Midlands because, after all, those are places based on no cult single culture being in charge, but rather it being a pluralistic multiple culture scenario, very friendly to immigration. But you also see large uh, uh, um, settlement pattern in Yankeedom, particularly in the upper, upper Midwest. And why would that be? Well, there's some certain self-selection that went on. I mean, that, those big dark sections up there are largely the Scandinavian immigration, upper Wisconsin and Minnesota. And that's because the Scandinavians were selecting to move there both for environmental reasons, because it was not so unlike Scandinavia, but also for cultural ones, because the sort of Puritan Calvinist legacy in New England, the frugality and uh, common social responsibility and a state church, in effect, was very similar to the Lutheran experience in Scandinavia. And indeed, those missionaries I told you about, those Yankee missionaries sent out to save California, Yankee missionaries were saved, sent out to save Michigan and to save Ohio and Minnesota, and to save it for the, the New England way from all of those terrible influences, Kentuckians. <laughs> Scary Catholics and their Papist conspiracy, we must save them all. So they had missionaries all over the place, and the missionaries had academic journals, you know, that they wrote and sent back home, the American Home Missionary Society Journal, reporting on the conditions they were encountering as they were going out to save uh, what was then considered the West. And they all unanimously report that, well, the Kentuckians are terrible people, and, um, they absolutely love the Scandinavians. They are model New Englanders. They would, they'll be the perfect people to carry on the New England quest. So what I'm saying is that there was a certain amount of self-selection and intel that was going back to the old world also that was informing where people moved and in many ways increased many of the differences between the nations because not all immigration came to the same places. And the thesis, by the way, the paradigm says, the assumption is that Yes, many people come and immigrate and, of course, change and alter and bring things and, and, and add to the richness of these cultures, just as they do when, they, when immigrants from third countries move to France or England or Germany. It's the same thing. But the dominant culture wins out in the long term. Maybe it doesn't change you, maybe not your children, but you know your grandchildren are probably going to assimilate. And my book is arguing that they're not assimilating into an American culture, but into one of these regional cultures, right down to the dialect of American English that the grandchildren speak. So that's the central argument uh, of the, uh, the way things work in the book. And a final remark, a caveat, when I talk about the characteristics of these nations, I am talking about the dominant culture, not individuals. Every single county you see on this map, uh, whether it's blue, totally blue, or totally red, or somewhere in between, has the entire spectrum of political opinion represented in individuals. The question is, do you as an individual, wherever you live, are there things you find enormously frustrating that are in the air that never seem to change about where you live? Or are you absolutely delighted about them or more likely a mix of the two? Those things you're talking about where this place doesn't seem to change or why is it this way here? It's not like that there. Those are the dominant cultural characteristics I'm talking about. So I will stop there and open it up to what I hope are uh, lots of questions. Thank you. <laughs>
in our day, we seem to confront uh, increasingly powerful homogenization trends like uh, popular media, consumer culture, and even sort of key historical events like World War II, 9-11, sort of jumped to the, to the front of my mind. Um, after 9-11, you had fire departments in every region, you know, raising uh, money or sending to buy a fire truck for New York City. Right. Uh, and so on. I just wonder how you respond to um, what seem on the surface yeah. to be increasingly powerful homogenization trends. Yeah, absolutely. An excellent question. And you know, there's a Starbucks in every corner, and the big box stores all look the same, and the franchise restaurants, you know, you could be, uh, you could be anywhere sometimes when you look outside your car window. And Twitter and Facebook and movies and Netflix and the internet, you would think that with all of those forces at work, that we would be coming more homogenous and more the same. But the empirical evidence is the opposite. I mean, the differences in almost any measurable way in opinion and political behavior and such between these cultures is currently growing, not shrinking. So the question is why? How can that possibly be given the homogenization forces at work? Um, part of the answer, I think, is uh, Bill Bishop, who, uh, his book, The Big Sort, asked a question. He took a county level analysis. He was asking a different research question. His research question was something along the lines of, uh, you know, he was interested in why is it that the number of landslide counties where, you know, consistently election after election, voters vote for one particular party by 20 points or more, um, why is it that the number of those counties in the country has grown dramatically over the past 30 years? It's something like, you know, I, I can't remember exactly, it was like 1970, there were 20% of the 3,100 counties in the country uh, were landslide is so defined, and now it's something like 60%. What on earth is going on? And the answer, they worked with demographers and did all kinds of data crunching and stuff, and the answer was, yes, people are moving around all over the country, that homogenizing effect and flying in airplanes and relocating, but to a large extent, to the degree that the mobile portion of the population has any control over where they go, they are choosing to live in places where they feel comfortable and among like-minded people in neighborhoods they feel share their values. They're shopping around. They're self-selecting. And if you overlay my, um, my map over Bill Bishop's county map, he wasn't looking at nations, to a remarkable extent as they sort into red and blue counties, as it were, they're actually sorting between nations. So that mobility itself, strangely enough, is sorting and enhancing differences between the regional cultures, not diminishing it. Now, as to what, how it can be that with all these other corrosive, homogenizing commercial effects, which I agree should be um, homogenizing things, I have no data. I only know that the observable evidence is that they're not. And I find it very intriguing as to why that might be. Some of you, any of you who are researchers in the audience, please, I will send you my coded spreadsheets and let, let us all know. <laughs> We'll crowdsource this. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, oh, oh, the people with the mic are in charge, you, not me. <laughs> uh, you made some reference in your website to the defeat of the Tea Party. Yeah. And uh, you knew we had Olympia Snow here uh, a few weeks ago. And Used to be my senator, she, yes. I think she commented about you, uh, you were on the, coming here. Would you comment about the, uh, about the, you said you saw the Tea Party in decline. And secondly, the New York Times ran that series about how um, these financial interests are beginning to sway the local politics with the deluge of, of out-of-state money coming in. I'm wondering if you right. have a, have any comment about that? Yeah, on the question of the Tea Party, I mean, the Tea Party is, uh, as a national phenomenon, I've written, is doomed, and indeed that's been happening because the center, it rode a wave initially at 2010 and has the characteristics of being a national movement. The Tea Party was everywhere. The Tea Party was in Maine. We elected a Tea Party governor in Maine. Yankee of Yankee states, what's going on with that? But as you've observed, the, the, the model would predict that the Tea Party would have a very difficult time in large swaths of the country, including Yankeedom, because the fundamental program that the Tea Party is seeking is essentially the same one as Appalachia and the Deep South, and is anathema to the centuries-old preferences and political notions of other parts of the country, including Yankeedom and New Netherland, the left coast especially. 
And indeed, observably, that's exactly what's happened, and increasingly so. I mean, the, the Tea Party's greatest successes um, have been very hard fought in Yankeedom. Scott Walker's uh, um, battle, you know, what Scott Walker did or even the, the um, um, right to work movement here in Michigan would both be totally mainstream political move in greater Appalachia or Deep South, which would encounter no resistance at all. Here, enormous battles in Wisconsin and Michigan, even to be successful with having to build entire infrastructures and uh, being an incredibly risky situation for any of the politicians who uh, were about to embark and try to cause that to happen. In Maine, uh, the, the, the Tea Party governors won in a vote split three ways uh, with 38% uh, of the vote and has never broken out of that same percentage. Uh, and both uh, houses of his party have been lost in the, uh, in the midterm elections. But most revealingly, you know, if you go to the, the shutdown caucus, the, the, the Tea Party congressional stalwarts who were the ones who were pushing all the way to perhaps even default on the federal debt in order to, uh, to meet their demands, their Atlantic magazine put together by several metrics and identified a list of 32 of them with no reference to regions. I unpacked where they all were from. And 80, over 80% 80 of them were from the far west the Deep South and Greater Appalachia. In fact, almost half of them were from Greater Appalachia. Yankeedom, population 52 million, roughly 100 congressional seats, two. One of them is uh, your congressman in this district, and the other is Michelle Bachman. Now, in this district, I understand from the national polling, or from national news stories, that uh, your congressman is having, since the shutdown, was receiving a lot of blowback from the business community here as well, and possibility of a challenger from, I guess, the center. You'll know more about that than I will. And in uh, Minnesota, Michelle Bachman, despite her national stature, in the most conservative district in Minnesota, only won re-election last time by 1%. Now, these would be, you know, politicians who would be slam dunk successful in other regional cultures. So it shows the level of cultural resistance to the Tea Party's programs, even in the places where it has been most successful. So, as, and what we've been seeing is uh, indeed a, a solidifying and a retreat of the Tea Party into the regional cultures um, whose uh, um, sort of centuries old values do embrace and are in accord with what the Tea Party is arguing for and retreat from the other places which means it can't dominate the entire federal and national stage, whatever you think about whether it should or not. It's just, it's isolated out by this regional paradigm, the underlying logic in the long term. I, uh, yes, please, do you need to get the mic over there? <clears throat> Sorry, I have a noisy bottle. <laughs> yeah. Only because you didn't talk about it. Um, could you talk a little bit about Ontario as being reflecting the Midlands culture? Oh, absolutely. I'd be happy to, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I'm, uh, Canada's well included in this book, and I'm glad you brought that up. So, you know, why is, you know, notice that the Atlantic provinces beyond New England are part of Yankeedom largely, except for the French shore of New Brunswick. Um, and uh, Ontario is not, it's part of the Midlands. Well, it's because they were settled, you know, it's following the same settlement stream logic. The original old settlers, um, after the defeat of New France, uh, who moved into what's now New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, were from New England, from Massachusetts and Maine. And in fact, uh, even after the revolution, when the Loyalists poured in, the Loyalists, they, essentially the Loyalists, as, they, as, they, uh, as the Loyalist cause was being lost in the revolution, all retreated to New York City, which was, uh, which was Royalist throughout the war. New Netherland was a Royalist stronghold, and were waiting there, and towards the end, there were these giant convoys of ships fleeing once it was clear the revolution was lost, taking entire families from all over uh, the eastern seaboard who had been Loyalist back to Britain, or to Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. So the Loyalists, even though they were quite numerical, I mean, we, there's this idea that the Loyalists founded New Brunswick. Yeah, they showed up, but they were splintered. They were deep southern planters, and they were New Netherland newspaper editors, and they were you know, Loyalist Yankees from Maine, and they didn't share a common culture. The Yankees they encountered there, the old settlers did, and ended up winning out. So the overall uh, culture ended up remaining uh, part of Greater New England, which is why you can go all the way to the tip of Cape Breton Island, and they're all there in the bar and in the hotel, looking at the Red Sox game, 
and wearing their Red Sox hats, Red Sox nation. They refer to the New England states as the Boston states, all the way clear to Newfoundland. Now, that's distinct from the Midlands experience, because after the revolution, uh, the British, em British Empire separated what had been you know, Quebec, what had been New France, into two provinces. What we now think of as Quebec was Lower Canada, and there was a new province, Upper Canada, which is now Ontario. It was essentially, um, there were almost no Europeans there, and they wanted it to settle it and attract settlers. Revolution had just happened, their empire on their knees, they wanted to pull market share from us. So they advertised, and they said, hey, you know, come on up here, Americans, you know, we, uh, we will give you no political rights, and you can't vote and stuff, but hey, low taxes, We'll stay out of your way, we'll give you nearly free land, and uh, stay out of your affairs. Well, in the American Revolution, the people of the Midlands were neutral in the American Revolution. They didn't want the revolution to happen at all. That's why George Washington, he was out there stranded in the Midland areas around Valley Forge. Nobody was bringing him any food, right? Because they were on the fence, and the British were the ones in Philadelphia, were the ones actually paying the money. And many of them were from pacifist set, sects and didn't want to fight the war. The Quakers and the Anabaptists and the Amish and so on and so forth. After the revolution, many, especially from the Scots-Irish parts of Pennsylvania, who had come down, by the way, to Philadelphia and kicked out the entire Midland-dominated government of Pennsylvania and taken over and created a revolutionary government. They literally took the, the people in the uh, Pennsylvania State House and the Pennsylvania uh, go governmental house and carried them out and dumped them in the street from their chairs and took over the government. So there was a, a revolutionary takeover, essentially, by the greater Appalachian part of Pennsylvania, getting rid of the Midlanders. After the revolution, it was payback time. You know, they, these people were quislings and had cooperated with the British Empire. So it was extremely unpleasant for many Midlanders living in post-revolutionary Pennsylvania. And so huge numbers of them took up the British offer because that's exactly what they wanted, right? People who distrust government and government interference, who want to be left alone to let their communities get on with it, Perfect deal. So large numbers of people came and were the uh, initial settlers of the southern part of uh, Upper Canada, which became Ontario, um, and uh, sort of establishing uh, that culture there. The Canadian historiography calls them erroneously the late loyalists. Very late indeed. They took a decade on average to decide that they were loyalists and leave. So, yeah. And predates, by the way, the, you know, the coming of the, of the, orange, the orange men and, and so on and so forth. So that is my argument. Toronto radio hosts have endorsed it, so they must know. <laughs> um, yes, sir. You can decide. I have, oh, okay. I have a quick, I have a quick question. Um, obviously, the history of these nations is based in European, Caucasians. Right. Do you factor race when uh, after our civil war and after emancipation, and then when the industrialization of the Midwest or North, right. where black people migrated North. How, what, how do you, uh, what do you say? How do you that? factor it? Yeah, how do you factor that? Or right. did they assimilate into those? Right. Well, the great tragedy of the African American experience in this country is they weren't allowed to be a dominant culture, right? They were treated as property. So they were denied that possibility. And the African, what this paradigm says and the history tells you is that the African American experience as a slave was different in distinct ways depending on whether you ended up in the Tidewater or Deep South or Greater Appalachia or indeed New Netherland and other uh, slaveholding places. And the experience afterwards when you moved uh, was different. Now, of course, racism was encountered everywhere, but it was different in the way it was applied and the possibility and movement and therefore the resistance you might have to pull depending on what regional culture you were dealing with, whether you were born there or whether during the Great Migrations people moved. Um, there are scholars who've worked specifically on that and I've read some of their work. Um, it's, it's tangential to the central thrust because I'm talking about the dominant cultures here. But of course, that's incredibly important in the contribution um, of African Americans, especially in the Deep South, but to Tidewater and of course to overall American culture is, is enormous, but not one of the dominant cultures because they weren't allowed to be. So that's it in a tiny nutshell. Okay, two questions. 
First, I was curious how the maps of the nations correlates with some of the maps about the regional language variations in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> and my understanding is despite the growth of mass media and the thought that it would become more homogenized, right. I think the research in the last 40 years is showing more variation, not homogenization in that. So I'm curious what you found <laughs> of that. And second question, now in Michigan we have a lot of our elderly leave the area and go into the deep south for the weather. Yeah. But I'm thinking of my friends in California where a lot of their parents, even though the only place their families ever lived was Northern California, and they were totally hippies and totally into the San Francisco culture, mm -hmm. they still went into El Norte at some point. It seemed like they became more conservative and wanted to move there. <laughs> and I'm just curious if there is anything about changing culture and age. Thank you. I haven't studied the age question. It's an intriguing one, but I have no data, but it's an interesting idea. I mean, I think you know, the, the general premise that we tend to get conservative as we get older is probably generally true statistically. What that means for how, where people decide to retire to is a really interesting question. I've always assumed that you know, in general, you're moving because you don't want to dig out of another snowstorm because, hey, I'm 80. I've, I've done enough of these. You know? I, I know what's going to happen next. I'm, I'm going south. And in Maine, we have a Maine to Florida access. I mean, all the old lobstermen and fishermen in Maine, or as Maine as can be, um, you know, once they retire and reach a certain age, all move down to the same three or four communities in, in south and central Florida, where apparently everybody there is from down east Maine. They're all down east. There's entire condo towers full of uh, down east Maine lobstermen. So um, it, it happens all over the place. But yeah, I haven't, I haven't thought about whether you know, we, could, we could tease out a political strand to it or not. And your first question about dialects is really, I mean, the dialect maps, yes, you see them reflected. Um, you can see the lines um, in almost any of the dialect maps you see put out there over time. And I, I do understand that uh, some regions are getting more pronounced in some of their uh, pronunciation and markers and stuff than others, but um, I haven't studied the, the, the latest trend lines in enough detail, but I do know that not surprisingly, if this paradigm is based on settlement patterns, that you would see dialectical patterns and the, 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 the maps uh, showing the uh, transmission of material culture over the landscape all match up to this um, for the obvious reasons. Microphone people are in charge. The last time I looked at a map, I remember that Alaska and Hawaii are also part of the United States, and I don't see them on this map. I just I wonder apologize. if you could, yes. could comment on those two states. Absolutely. So um, I had to decide somewhere where this project was going to leave off, because as I kept going, you know, am I going to keep going southward and start dealing with the, whatever it is, the Aztec um, cultural heritage of central Mexico versus the Mayan zone and, and work my way outward. Uh, you know, when will I stop? I'll be in Tierra del Fuego and this book will not be 400 pages but 1,200 and you know, I'll start losing the thread of narrative. Oh, hard enough doing an entire continent over 400 years. And remember, the structure of the book is a history, so I'm introducing the founding of each of these places, a chapter each, and then the next chapter is rolling out their movement across the landscape through the 19th century, and the next chapter is dealing with their relationship in the Civil War. So every time I add a nation, I have to add that in nation's entire history since the time it was settled, right? So I had to put some limits on it. And the definition I picked was, okay, the core um, hearth, you know, landing point of that culture has to be located in what is now the United States and Canada. And that was sort of my drawing off point. Now, unfortunately, that severed off three places. Um, the southern part of Florida, which of course plays a key role in electoral politics, so people ding me on that, but again, my goal was not to describe today's electoral politics when I wrote this, but to describe how this has affected and shaped the creation of our country and our history. And South Florida, you know, by and large, it was not a major player in this history. You know, there weren't very many people living there until after 1950. So when you're talking about the Civil War and such, it, it was not, it's a peripheral actor. Um, and it is part of the Spanish Caribbean zone. So the maritime uh, trading culture based out of Havana that dominated much of the Caribbean was very distinct from, certainly from El Norte and also from, uh, from Mexico City and the Vice Royalty in Peru and was its own thing. I deal with it quite a bit in my book on pirates because it's, the, the history of that is central and takes place in those areas. But it was just too much to chew on that. Same thing with Hawaii, that's part of Greater Polynesia, and I've been out in that area and traveled through Micronesia and stuff, it's a fascinating culture. You'd have to start with the founding of the area by the great you know, celestial navigators in their outrigger canoes 10,000 years ago, traveling between these islands and the relationship of the kings to the Yankee missionaries and all. It's a great story, but again, it's, it's, 
it's far enough to the periphery that when I had to make tough decisions, uh, I had to cut Hawaii out of that as well. And finally, Newfoundland, uh, the island, not, not Labrador, uh, because Newfoundland is not the same as the rest of the Maritimes. It's an Anglo-Irish culture going way back, uh, settled another 150 or 200 years before New England was with its own story and in fact was an independent self-governing um, province until the end of World War II when it uh, voted to join Canada in a controversial vote that many elderly Newfoundlanders are still furious about because one of the other options was independence. And to this day, Newfoundlanders of any age when you visit there say when they get on the ferries that take you to the, to the mainland in Nova Scotia, they say they're going to Canada. <laughs> they are Red Sox fans though. <laughs> we have time for one more question. In your uh, discussion, you, you mentioned a number of companies that are very successful and we hear about in the news today, all the time. In the left coast, I mean. In yeah. the left coast. Is, have you done any studies or any correlation as to why that is true? Because it seems like a century ago, that was happening in Yankeedom. Right. Whereas now, it's, it's all on the left coast. And you Even in the 1940s, it would have been happening, yeah, Route 128 around Boston. Right. Yeah. And is it the... Is it the you know, the, the free thinking, things like that, that are attributing to the success, or is, is there anything that you can uh, speak I can, to that? Yes, again, I don't have any real data, but I, I mean, I know that part of it is that, I believe that part of that is that cultural fusion that's so fascinating, that idea that we can make a better world. I will invent an iPod and a tablet, and you all laugh at me and say, why would anyone use a tablet? What am I going to do with this? Lo and behold, you know, I shall remake the earth. You know, it's, it, that is there, and that Appalachian individualism, this iPod, you know, will be about you and allow you to do your thing, you know. Um, that combination somehow, I think, must be assisting because of the concentration of that kind of innovation that has transformed the world in the past 20 years so much. I don't have any data of that, but my instinct is that. As to, I mean, prior to, you know, it, it was only with World War II and our effort to ramp up to defeat, you know, the fascists and the imperial Japan, um, that the military did incredible amounts of spending, particularly in the West and on the West Coast, to start you know, building naval facilities, military facilities, and aircraft, and Boeing, and so on and so forth. That all happened because of a dire existential need for the, you know, the Federation at large. And that was a scientific and technological project. So I think it was only with that spending that created and brought in the engineers and the people who would later be the spin-off companies off things like, you know, like Boeing and, and all those other companies you know, up and down the, uh, the West Coast that I think created the, the, lay the ground for the later innovative uh, Silicon Valley kind of economy to come afterwards. So that, I think that's why it wasn't there, say, in, you know, in 1940s when it would have been around 128. But I'm making this up off the top of my head. These are all hypotheses, but that's what I'm going to go with. Thank you, Colin. Thank you all very much. Yes, give him a hand. <laughs> don't, don't go anywhere. Don't, don't. All right, let's go stand a little bit more in the middle of the stage. No Hallenstein Center event is complete without the speaker. Getting one of our Grand Rapid awesome. Specialties to you, uh, yeah, Ralph Hallenstein swag bag. Thank so, you. <laughs> thank you very much. Very much welcome. appreciated. Thank you so much. And thank you all for having me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our evening. On behalf of Gail Davis and myself, thank you so much for attending this Hallenstein Center American Conversations. Drive home safely. <laughs> <laughs>